Hello, my salacious historians. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all of the messages about the first episode of Salacious History. You have no idea how grateful I am to hear such lovely feedback on a project that I've been working on for months. You guys are amazing. If you're enjoying the podcast, could you do me a favor? Could you please share episodes on social media? Listeners are much more likely to listen to podcasts that are recommended by a friend. And this helps spread the word about the podcast to a larger audience. Thanks again for your support. Now on to today's episode. Salacious History discusses sex, romance, and many other topics that are intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Salacious History, the podcast that explores moments in history that were shaped by sex, romance, and people who were generally down to clown. I'm your host, Sarah Duncan. So today's episode focuses on the genetic legacy of conqueror Genghis Khan. As we'll talk about in this episode, a large portion of today's global population can be traced back to this one man. How was this accomplished? Let's find out. I do want to warn our listeners that this episode discusses rape and violence towards women. Listener discretion is advised. The man known as Genghis Khan was born in August of 1162 with the name Temujin, meaning iron worker or blacksmith. He was born near the border between modern Mongolia and Siberia. He was the second son of his father, Yesuge, who was the prominent chief in the Ka Mag Mongol Confederation and an ally of Togrul, the Karaite tribe. Temujin was the first son of his mother, Holun. Holun had been kidnapped by Temujin's father and forced into marriage. I deeply apologize if I butchered any of those pronunciations. I did my research, but I'll be the first to admit that historical and foreign names are not my strong suit. Very little is known about his childhood due to the lack of contemporary written records. The few sources that do exist often have contradicting accounts. Here's the best account that I've been able to put together. Temujin's childhood was tumultuous, to say the least. At the time, dozens of nomadic tribes on the Central Asian steppe constantly fought over power and resources, and this created a very violent and unpredictable environment for Temujin to grow up in. In 1171, Temujin's father died when he was poisoned by an enemy tribe. Temujin attempted to assume his father's role as chief of the Borjajin tribe, but the tribe refused to be ruled by such a young boy, even if he was the rightful heir. The tribe cast out Temujin, his mother, and his three brothers, forcing them to fend for themselves. Temujin was only nine years old at the time. For the next several years, the family lived in extreme poverty. They survived by gathering wild fruits and hunting small game, such as marmots. When he was 13 years old, Temujin killed his older half-brother, Bector, during a dispute over hunting spoils and assumed the head of the household. In 1178, the 16-year-old Temujin married Bort, with whom he would go on to have four sons and an unknown number of daughters. Records on daughters were pretty much non-existent at this time. Bort was kidnapped after they wed, and Temujin launched a daring mission to rescue her. As a result of this rescue, Temujin began forming alliances, attracting a growing number of followers, and building a reputation as a fierce warrior. So one of the keys to Temujin's early military success was his willingness to make leadership and military appointments based on competency rather than family ties. What a concept! Although Temujin was an animist, his followers included Buddhists, Muslims, and Christians. By the year 1205, Temujin had defeated all of his rivals, 
including his former best friend Jamuka. Temujin would go on to become the founder and first great Khan, or emperor, of the Mongol Empire, which subsequently became the largest contiguous empire in history after his death. He came to power by uniting many of the nomadic tribes of Northeast Asia. Previously, the only way to form political alliances was by arranging marriages between children of rival rulers. After founding the empire and being proclaimed Genghis Khan, a name meaning universe ruler, he launched the Mongol invasions that conquered most of Eurasia. His military campaigns were often accompanied by large-scale massacres of the civilian population. As well as modern-day Mongolia, Khan's empire included most of China, Korea, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Afghanistan, Moldova, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Georgia, Turkmenistan, Kuwait, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and some parts of Russia. Whew, I need to lie down after that list. By the end of his life, Genghis Khan had conquered nearly 12 million square miles. Hey, all you mothers. Have you had a chance to check out Motherhood on Tap? We're a comedy podcast where two mom friends drink adult beverages and laugh their way through the struggles of parenting. Some of our favorite episode topics so far include depictions of pregnancy and birth on TV, infants are terrifying, and mom injuries. Or should we say mom juries? But mostly we just laugh at our own dumb jokes. Hey, at least we make ourselves laugh, right? So if you're a mom who really needs a laugh and a stiff drink, put the kiddos down for a nap and come check out Motherhood on Tap. You can listen and subscribe at motherhoodontap.com or find Motherhood on Tap on your favorite podcasting app. Bye-bye! Genghis Khan is definitely a controversial historical figure. What I mean by that is, depending on who you talk to, he's either considered a hero or an absolute terrorist and murderer. In 2003, a historical genetics paper reported that a substantial portion of men in today's world are direct line descendants of Genghis Khan. This direct line was based on the presence of a particular Y chromosome that dates back to a male who lived approximately 1,000 years ago. Since Y chromosomes are only passed from father to son, the Y chromosome is essentially a record of a man's patrilineage. It's estimated that at the time of Genghis Khan's death, approximately 10% of the men residing within the border of the Mongol Empire carried his Y chromosome. If we do some quick math to calculate the number of generations since that time, it is estimated that approximately 0.5% of men in today's world carry his Y chromosome, or 1 in 200. That's a total of 16 million individuals. Whew. Since this paper was published in 2003, other so-called super Ys have been uncovered. However, Genghis Khan is still one of the most extreme cases known to historians and geneticists. So how did Genghis Khan come to have so many descendants? As I mentioned earlier, he was known for scorched earth tactics and widespread massacres of the civilian populations he conquered. He and his soldiers were merciless in the aftermath of any conflict, commonly executing the enemy men and taking the women and children as spoils of war. Genghis Khan was responsible for as many as 40 million deaths during his reign, more than Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin combined. When asked about what gave him joy in life, he was known to have said, quote, The greatest happiness is to vanquish your enemies, chase them before you, to rob them of their wealth, to see those dear to them bathe in tears, to clasp to your bosom their wives and daughters, unquote. Like I said earlier, he is a pretty controversial figure. <laughs> All told, 
the Mongols' attacks may have reduced the entire world's population by as much as 11%. The Mongol victory feasts that followed their conquest were epic. It is said that Genghis Khan and his commanders would tear at huge mounds of nearly raw horse meat, while captive girls were paraded for their inspection. Historians assert that Genghis Khan reveled in marrying or taking for concubines the wives and daughters of his enemies. I don't think it's any stretch of the imagination to say that these women did not go into his bed willingly but most likely complied in order to avoid a worse fate. It is also safe to wager that any woman brave enough to rebel would have been killed or given over to Genghis Khan's soldiers for their own sexual enjoyment. According to popular legend, Genghis Khan demanded that he have a new partner brought to his bed every night. He specified that this woman must be beautiful, a virgin, and an inhabitant of his most recently conquered lands. It's suspected that this last request was due to his desire to mix the bloodlines of the conquerors and the conquered peoples, which would ultimately result in creating one empire and one people. Some sources also state that he measured a woman's beauty in carrots. If he rated a woman below a certain number of carrots, she was automatically sent to the tents of his officers. Despite this prolific campaign of conquest and rape, it still seems impossible that one man could be the single common ancestor for 16 million of today's men. Yet the region where these men are found matches the reach of Genghis Khan's empire at the time of his death. It is impossible to know how many children were conceived and born as a result of this systematic pattern of rape and abuse. But geneticists have extrapolated that he fathered more offspring than anyone in history. Genghis Khan's large family tree of descendants is also due in part to his children and grandchildren. Khan's oldest son is reported to have had 40 sons of his own. His grandson, Kublai Khan, had 22 legitimate sons and reportedly added 30 virgins to his harem on a yearly basis. Genghis Khan died in August of 1227 at the age of 65. The exact cause of his death is difficult to pinpoint. Depending on which source you consult, the cause of death is attributed to illness, being killed in action against the Western Zhao, falling from his horse, or wounds sustained during battle. While it is safe to say that Genghis Khan will be remembered for centuries to come, it is yet to be seen whether he will be mostly identified as a great conqueror or a genocidal warlord. That wraps up our episode on the descendants of Genghis Khan. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to check out the Salacious History page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Salacious Hist. That's S-A-L-A-C-I-O-U-S-H-I-S-T. This podcast is researched, written, recorded, edited, produced, and marketed all by me. So please show me some much needed love and support and partner with me on Patreon.com. If you have questions, corrections, or ideas for future episodes, you can email me at salacioushistory at gmail.com. I'm Sarah Duncan. See you next time.